so so these guys that that I get to talk to up here, um, again, they get to really navigate this industry from a couple different angles. Um, you know, Ryan Celsius, man, artist, label owner, navigator, artist helper, right? All the things, right? And and you know, Matt, from from what I understand of your day to day, you know on the label side, on that marketing side, understanding how artists are cutting through, right, out here in these digital interwebs and all that stuff. Um, I wanna give you guys an opportunity to kind of talk about, just from your lens, what exactly it is that you do, right? Because I think that'll frame up how this conversation will go and uh, so you guys understand the perspective that they're coming from as they answer some of these questions. But I'm gonna tell y'all right now, I have some questions that I wanna understand from them <laughs> and I wanna ask but I also want to make sure that you guys don't leave here with unanswered questions that you know would be helpful on your journey, right? So if you guys know you have questions, I want you to be right up front thinking about them, writing them down. And what I'll try to do uh, as our moderator is save a, a bunch of time so we can answer as many of your questions as possible, right? I'm gonna try to ask some good questions. That's what I'll be doing. But I really want to make sure we have time for y'all. Does that sound good? Cool. Then with that, we're going to get into it. First and foremost, how y'all feeling? So good. First time in Philly. I'm from London, so I'm feeling the love. Thank you so much. Um, he flew over to Pond to be here with us, y'all. Yeah, I'm here for you guys. Fire. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. How man. you feel, Ryan? I'm super stoked. Super stoked. <laughs> good. Good. I'm feeling incredible. Um, been been coming direct for a long time, so That's right. uh, really excited about this conversation. Really excited about it. Cool. Let Let's get up into it. Um, first, just let folks know. You know, I gave like a. a five second background of who you guys are, but I would love it if you, maybe you guys just, you know, spend a couple, a couple seconds letting people know, like, what is it that you guys are doing kind of on the day to day, right? Ryan, you're a man with many hats. Yeah. You're not wearing a hat at all right now, but figuratively, <laughs> they're all up there. Uh, let us know a little bit about kind of like who you are in this industry, yeah. right? And, and what that work looks like. Most definitely. Um, um, for about the last four years, I've been an A&R and an artist manager with The Muse and wore a couple other hats as well. In addition to that, I'm a YouTuber, um, a touring producer, DJ, and analog visual artist. And I think really relevant to this conversation, um, for the 11 years before then, I was functioning as a hardware and software quality assurance engineer for a medical tech company. And from that experience, that gives me some perspective on how the entertainment world, the music world, the arts world intersect directly with the evolution of emerging technology and how anyone, artists, creatives, et cetera, should really kind of think and focus on where the tech is going and where that leaves them. Is it helping you? Is it hurting you? Those type of ideas, I think, um, will be some of the things we get into in a little bit, but that, that's me. Uh, yeah, and, and real, hold on real quick though. You, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned, you like put YouTuber in there, like real just, fast. Just threw it in there. You threw it in there real fast, <laughs> but like, the numbers say that you you out here for real on YouTube. I'm just gonna say that. You know what I'm saying? I try to embrace the platforms. He you he, know? he embraces the platforms at a very high level. He's a very humble guy. But uh, y'all ever see some of those really dope, cool, lo-fi YouTube streams that like just be running forever and like playing awesome music? He he be he be doing yeah. You know I mean some of that on these interwebs. Yeah, yeah. And, and doing it very very well. So. I appreciate your humble candor, but I just got to flex for you, if you want. Much appreciation. He's outside. He's outside. <laughs> Matt, let us know. What, what is it you be out here doing in these, uh, in these real world and, and digital streets? It's a good question. So um, I'm based in, uh, in London in the artist marketing team. So day to day, I'm, I have a roster of artists that we have licensed tracks with at Amuse. And it's my responsibility to constantly push the boat out in terms of what we can try and do to make the most out of their catalog and new music. So always slightly different approaches to both, you know, what's going on. And because we're a distribution company as well, um, every artist we work with is at a different stage of their career and growth. So the challenge is always different, which means that I need to stay on top, always try new things, take risks, uh, back it up with data, of course, always back it up with data. Um, so. Yeah, that's kind of what I do day to day. Check in with my artists, see what we can do. Dig it, I dig it. So let me, let me ask you guys this, because really what we're gonna talk about at the heart of this conversation is the evolution of technology, right? And what that means for us as creators. How many of y'all are self-described tech nerds? I wanna know. Ooh, okay, a little, few more than I thought. Not all of y'all though. 
How many of y'all are like, tech is cool, but it's about the art for me? Okay, cool, cool. I respect that. And, and I really wanna, wanna, wanna do a good job as we have this conversation of figuring out where's the balance, right? And, and I remember there was a time when I was younger, there was some tech tr like trends and transitions that were happening, right? Like I, I'm of a certain age where like, I actually remember days before, like I'll just put it this way. I remember when like it was noisy to get on the internet. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, the uh, AOL dial up too. You know? Yeah, we all know that song. And yeah. don't let me be on the internet and then like my grandmother wanna use the phone and now oh, no. I can't be on AIM anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> But I also know that before even that was a thing, there was a time where some people thought the internet was a fad, mm -hmm. right? They were like, oh, it's here today, but like eventually it'll be gone. All those people, they're hiding, they're hiding right now, right? Mm -hmm. But then I also remember as like a kid, one of the things I used to love was this idea of going to stores to buy music, going to actually buy physical CDs, but then when I got hip to LimeWire and Morpheus and I was burning them, <laughs> whole different landscape, right? And there, y'all was getting viruses, I heard you. Yep. Don't do that to your family computer, reckless. But at, at that moment, there was also a bunch of people who loved it, and y'all was probably burning CDs like me, but there was probably, not a probably, I know there was a ton of people who were also super resistant to that technology change. And then it happened again when it went from MP3s to streaming, right? Where some people was like, oh, this isn't gonna be a thing. Now it's a thing. Mm -hmm. Some people saying, yo, this is great for visibility. Some people like, nah, but y'all not paying these coins though, right? So there's always consistently been this thing. Um, but what I, what I guess I wanna know first is like, how are you guys thinking about these transitions that have already happened and how creatives have had to pivot along the way? What do you think the best artists are keeping in the forefront of their minds as these technical shifts happen, right? Because there's some artists who didn't make the leap from yeah. physical to streaming, right? But there's some that really did well. And, and Ryan, you mentioned this when you said YouTube, you were like, yo, I use the tools. Mm -hmm. What should artists be thinking about when they think about these shifts that are happening time after time, decade after decade? Let's start there. Yeah, I think um, I'm Matt. I think, uh, yeah, incredible question. And I think uh, for me, it, it goes back to, to analyzing history, right? You mentioned pre-internet, yeah. right? You mentioned post-internet, you mentioned the idea of the, the MP3 era fading into the streaming era. You know, what era are we in now? I think we might be approaching a, a new one, perhaps, of maybe things are just generated for you. Maybe there's something that looks unfamiliar right now. But I think, for me, the best artists, and I think you've had plenty of those artists here at, at REC. For example, uh, let's take Armani, for example. Um, utilize the tools so efficiently to get his music out there, right? utilized things that some people might have opinions on. For example, there's resistance to things like TikTok from some artists or utilizing certain tools because um, there's a stigma or something around them. But I think as long as artists keep in mind what their personal goals are, some people's personal goal is to make what they wanna make how they wanna make it. Money be damned, you know, whatever be damned, exposure, they just wanna make what they wanna make and have the tools to do that. And to those artists, I would say, you still need to really be hip on what tools exist. Constantly go and search for the technology because it's, it really is available. And at this point in human history, the majority of it is free to access. Yeah. And the barrier to entry is incredibly low. So you're not really paying with anything but your time and your energy to really add tools to your, your bucket. So that's kind of my, my, my general opinion on uh, grasping those tools and why you should use them. Yeah, I, I dig that. I dig that a lot. And, and you mentioned Armani White, um, who, you know, I believe is just, he's, he's having an incredible run right now, mm -hmm. right? And, and he's been someone around our camp since 2015, you know, we were shooting music videos with him and, and going to places like A3C. And I remember I had a conversation with Armani and I was talking to him about how much he was leveraging TikTok, 
right? Real quick, how many of y'all on TikTok as artists? Okay. And um, Armani, outside of the music, he also makes these hilarious TikToks. Uh, one of them, he's a series called like uh, Philly Bull Diary, mm. right? Where he just be getting his thoughts off. And I was like, Armani, why do you spend so much time doing that? Like, why, do you, why are you on TikTok the way you are? And he kept it really simple. He's like, because that's where my fans are. And that's the kind of content they need to see from me. So he almost had this like fan first mentality mm -hmm. to why he was using the technology he was using, which I thought was, was brilliant. And you know, Matt, a lot of your job is like to figure out how artists can connect to their fans. So what does the idea of fan first mean to you, right? Like how do you think about that whole idea? That's a really great question. I, and I think the best way to kind of summarize that well, answer that, sorry, is to understand the relationship that you can have as an artist with your fans and make that as direct as possible. So if you do have a team or support or, you know, if you do work with a major or, or not, um, I think understanding, creating those channels between your fans and yourself and your music is the paramount thing. So obviously what we're going to be talking about today and now and is how tech supports that. So TikTok, for example, like I, I constantly have this conversation with my artists all the time with everyone and so the way that i see tiktok as an example is it's not the best platform to like plug your music generally speaking yeah. you need to remember that tiktok is an entertainment platform first so i've worked with a few artists on just building their audience yeah. before they actually even start mentioning they got music out so it's like 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 with amani it's like you're talking about how he brings it back to Philly. And it's like, it's a comedic skit. So like, I've got an artist at the moment who they just do like three piece acapellas, right? Mm. But then they always find ways to tie, tie back. So I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's not always about constantly reminding people you're there. It's like understanding that for a platform like TikTok as one, just one example, they're there to be entertained. It's there, you, you've got what, one, two, three seconds to win them over. And if you're just like, hey, my AP's out on Friday, it's kind of like not always the best place to do that. So with that, I'd also say being patient. So also, as um, Ryan said, the, the barrier to entry is super low. It's on you to try out new things. Um, but also be patient when it doesn't work out straight away. Like it might not be the right platform for you or the right time. So it's always a balance of being forward thinking, risky, trying new things. But then when it's not working out, like understanding why it isn't and taking a step back. I dig that. And, and, and I wonder, Ryan, um, if you want to add to that, like, what, is, what does it mean to be fan first, in your opinion, especially from a tech standpoint? Um, and maybe as someone who also is working really closely with artists and, and, and doing your own thing too, um, you know, how are you adjusting, right? Yeah. As all these changes are happening in real time, people will be like, yo, the algorithm changes every other day, right? Like, how, how are you navigating that and adjusting when you need to? Yeah, I think... Um I think he hit a, a crucial point, you know, go to where your fans are. So we talked about TikTok, but what if there's other platforms that make more sense for, you know, a smaller underground artist, right? Maybe it's Kick, or maybe you should be on YouTube, or maybe you should be on one of, one of a dozen other platforms that maybe the biggest artists aren't on there, but maybe your community is hyper-specifically on there. And then on all those platforms, what you should be doing is seeing what are the, what are the features that are being added to this platform? week to week, that's a crucial thing, right? If YouTube adds a new feature, you need to use that feature immediately if that's where your, your fans are because the platforms themselves, remember, they're businesses and they've invested energy into making new features, new tools, and so that's what I typically tell artists that I work with. You know, let's find where your fans are, and let's utilize the tools within that space, and then let's stay hip on what's changing within that space very specifically, you know, go, go, to, go to the YouTube website, go to your creator studio, see the release notes, see what got added, right? Oh, now they're supporting podcasts. Maybe now's the time that we put this podcast out, right? You know, those type of things are what I think being fan first is all about. I'm curious, let's, let's, um, let's do this real quick. This is a safe space. So I'm gonna ask some questions. I want y'all to be real honest. Raise your hand again if you have a TikTok. Raise your hand if you actually are using it though. Raise your hand if you guys are actively collecting emails. Ooh, just in general. Okay, fewer. How many of y'all are collecting phone numbers? Okay, 
So maybe probably like nine of y'all out of the 50 or so, however many are in this room, right? One thing I just think is so important for us all to remember is like all these platforms are just vehicles to engage our fans and find our fans. But if we're doing it right, we should be using those platforms to push them somewhere that we actually own. Like that's the power of collecting that email, right? Or collecting that phone number. So you can actually have that direct touch point that Ryan had mentioned. Um, so I just want everyone to think about that. And then also real quick, you mentioned that there might be better places to engage your fans mm -hmm. than on, on you know, TikTok. How many of y'all are, are using other platforms? I would love it if you guys would just shout out, like shout out where you think the best place to find your fans specifically. We might find uh, that some people not hit to all these different platforms. Go ahead and shout them out. Where y'all find it? Instagram, Instagram, Inst Facebook, YouTube. Yep, where else? Uh, Twitter. Yep, Twitch, I heard. Twitter, Instagram, where else? Discord. 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 Fire. Love Discord. Discord Big is fire. Fan of Discord. Where else? I ain't hear nobody say Reddit. Y'all wanna be on Reddit? LinkedIn. Couple. LinkedIn? You finding fans on LinkedIn? Hey. Yo, he follows me on LinkedIn. That's fire. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Keith Appreciate you. Keith is success. Follow Will on LinkedIn. You know what I'm saying? A lot of opportunities on LinkedIn, bruh. Station head. Station head. Ooh, that's a good one. What else? Facebook. Facebook we heard that one. I didn't hear nobody say Bandcamp. Oh, yeah, definitely. Y'all don't be on Bandcamp? You never heard of Bandcamp? Oh, you heard it, but you don't be on Bandcamp? <laughs> Yo, don't sleep on that Bandcamp Friday. SoundCloud, of course. Okay, cool. I just wanted to, to have us shout them out just in case there were ones that maybe we're not on that, we, that could be valuable to us. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, what was that? Audio Mac. Audio Mac. Yeah, shout out Audio Mac. They cool. They cool. Um, okay, so I, I, I do want to, I want to bring this up. Some of us might get triggered. Some of us might be excited. The undisputed latest innovation to the music game and this tech art landscape is AI, right? Yeah, who said, well, who's excited? Okay, cool, and let's be real. Who's afraid of AI and what's about to happen? It's a safe space. A lot of y'all, okay, fair, fair. And I think both, both sides are valid, right? Um, but I would like to believe that, like, again, and I said this on Morning Coffee on our, our um, show that we have on Fridays, I don't think artists are going to get replaced by AI, right? But I do think creatives might get replaced by creatives who do use AI, mm -hmm. right? So I'm Absolutely. curious. I would love to hear both of you guys' individual perspectives. Um, how do you think creatives can benefit from AI, right? And we're going to get into some of the downfalls and the things we got to avoid, but first... Let's talk about what do you see the benefits of a creative leveraging AI are? And if you can give some examples too, I would love that. Yeah, of course. And so I, I really see the use of AI as like at least where it's at now, which is obviously gonna be changing like in the next few years and growing and whatnot. Yeah. But um, I see it as a really good crea creative foundation. So don't like just expect it to change, you know, make, you know you're gonna be the best artist ever because an algorithm wrote your music. That's not, obviously that might happen. Great if it does. But what I'm saying is, um, like say if you use ChatGPT, who else, who's used ChatGPT here? Yeah, we are Heavy. here. Heavy. <laughs> so like, I mean, I was just talking with um, one of our managers who's actually here, but um, um, we have an artist who, you know, we just, we, we typed in, write a song in the style of this artist, and then it came out with these lyrics. And it's like, you know, I probably, kind of spot on like it's like I can see where you got the influences from but um, surprising where it is at the moment you know I, I think as a creative foundation you can kind of take parts from it like I know this isn't music related but I just want to say as well like, a friend of mine is a screen, uh, screenwriter he, is, he wrote three episodes of a show and said finish make, make a fourth one so like learn the third one wrote Crazy. a fourth and it's, he's not going to put that out but like he like grabbed small elements of that that made sense to him and his story. Mm -hmm. So, and then even with the image generating one, like uh, with Dolly, um, he typed in like, uh, he described characters and it generated images based on it. So it's That's like right. for, if he's pitching it to a show, he's like, this is kind of what I'm looking for, like even for casting. So, sorry, going back to music, it's like if you're writing lyrics or, you know, using um, another tool, it's, yeah, I really can't emphasize as a creative foundation. It's not the be all or the end all, but use it. Don't be afraid. Like, just take what you can. If it doesn't yeah. work, it's not working for you. Sure. But yeah, just 
be like decisive with what you can take from it and how you can keep bringing it back to the art form that we keep talking about. Yeah, that's real. Ryan, what's your take, bro? How are you thinking about AI? How can we take advantage of AI as creatives? I think that um, with AI specifically, there's a lot of sensational things, right? The most obvious one is the text to image with Dolly 2 and things like that that came out. And then more sensationally this past uh, year, there's been innovations on the audio side. A lot of the producers in the room have seen a lot of innovation in, in that space. Um, and I think that that's kind of the obvious things. What I think that creators in this room definitely should know about is on the productivity side. How many that new part. tools are being created? How much time you could save? Running a label, for example. How much administrative things are you just spending hours on that you could be spending finding new talent or developing or coming up with ideas, right? I think the productivity side of AI, those type of tools that save you time and energy across the board are the ones that really excite me um, and really help kind of build, at, you're, you're empowering the engine of your brand, of your business, of everything you're doing by using these AI productivity tools. For example, uh, very specifically in the field of sort of automation, right? Um, you have tools now that can send out 100 emails, get the response to those emails, put that response into a bunch of spreadsheets, add those spreadsheets to a PDF in some storage place, and then when someone asks you for your, your P&Ls or how much, how much do we make, how much do we lose, et cetera, it's all handled for you in a way, right? Tools that can execute in ways that you yourself could execute, but simplify it, save time, give you more options. And uh, to, what, to what Matt was saying about um, going back to text to image, things like that, these creative tools, a lot of times they can be used just to prototype, right? To say, hey, I want a thousand options of what this will look like. And I use my expertise to say which one is the best one, right? And I think that using it in that way will be hyper, hyper efficient for something that would have taken two weeks to make this album cover perfect to the, art, to, to the artists. Um, that now could take maybe three or four days. But the effort is still there, but it's just more efficient. So that's, that's my take on it. Um, don't, don't just look at the trees, look past the trees to what does this imply? What other tools will be created as a result of, oh, we can do text to image, we could do text to video maybe, we could do text to 3D environment, we could do text to video game, we could do text to movie, right? I think following and, and looking at those innovations will be increasingly important. Um, yeah. No, I think you're right. And, I, and I'm really glad you brought up the productivity side, because I think when we think about creatives and AI, we automatically think about them in the AI in the creative process not how AI can free us up to spend more human time in the creative process, mm -hmm. right? And I think for me, when I think about the productivity side, I feel like AI is really leveling the playing field in so many ways, right? Absolutely. I'll be honest, myself included, a lot of creatives I know get anxiety when they're writing a really important email. Oh, hold on, I heard, I heard it, so y'all resonate. Y'all resonate with that? But the idea of going to a chat GPT and saying, hey, I want to reach out to this brand and I want to communicate to them that I want to work and collaborate with them in this way, write me a professional email that introduces myself and who I am and ask this. And then all of a sudden, now you got three paragraphs, it's directly to the point, right? And, and there's a professionalism that you know is present there. And that's important, right? But then also taking it even further and, and being able to do some of the things that you mentioned with automation, I think it, it really levels that playing field. And then also, I just saw uh, a couple weeks ago, generative fill mm -hmm. for in Photoshop. You got designers in the room? Y'all know what I'm talking about, generative fill? Yeah. You have one image and then you literally can just select some stuff and then type what you want to be there instead and all of a sudden it's there. And I remember there was a time where I'm in Photoshop and it's like, I'm just not that good using the mask tool so I can't articulate what I want to be there. But now it can be, right? So it almost makes it like, the role as a creative in that sense now is it's about the vision, it's about being a director more than it is about being in the minutia of like, I have to execute this little detail, right? And if you didn't spend 10,000 hours in Photoshop like someone else did, you can still compete. And I think there's something powerful about that, right? Definitely. All right. Um, 
So I, I wanna I wanna start to go into okay now what do we need to watch out for right? But first before I even go into the, some of the negatives, I wanna know from like you know Amuse is, is a DSP in, in in a way right? Like you guys are distributing music, shall I say? Um, as a distributor, how are you guys thinking about some of these AI songs? Right? Like if somebody's like cooking up an AI song that sounds like Drake, but it's not Drake. Like how do y'all manage a relationship with the DSPs like Spotify or Apple Music when it comes to someone distributing stuff that's using AI that may not be their likeness, right, in their voice? How are y'all thinking about that? Have y'all, I'm sure you'll cross that bridge at some point, right? Yeah, yeah, I think um, from, from my perspective, I think that problem is something that's already existed. People are constantly uploading things to Amuse that are not theirs or some type of weird scam or... Oh, that'd be happening already? <laughs> at, at high volume. At high, at high, high volume. The scammers is outside. Yeah, they're, they're saying, I'm, I'm Drake, I'm Future, I got a feature with Lil Uzi, and they don't, Damn. right? That's crazy. But they can Please type don't do that, by the way, y'all. Don't be that guy. <laughs> Ryan will come find you. Who knows? <laughs> I felt like that stopped at LimeWire, right? Where like oh, no. you would download a song and it said like featuring Lil Wayne and it was like <laughs> Bill Clinton's voice or something. Like hey, the, right. the old tactic still, I, maybe they don't work as well. We're, we're pretty much on top of it. But from my perspective, it, that's a problem that's already existed. Now those terrible things people upload just sound a little bit better or more accurate to, to, to the, the original artist. Um, but I think from a security standpoint, it doesn't, it doesn't introduce a completely new problem, as I think a lot of people assume it does, because there's already things in place to prevent sort of fraud at a high level. It's really about if they took it to an extra level, and hey, we put out a, a, a track that sounds like Drake, and we made a fake email, and we did a fake Zoom call with a fake Drake team, you know, all those things are technically more possible now, so that, that would be a new challenge. But um, just the presenting it as it is with the, the AI voices, I think it's less of a new challenge than people would assume from a distribution standpoint. Yeah. Dang, y'all got to deal with a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's crazy. The finesse is at an all-time high. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. Um, so, so let's go down. You know, we talked about kind of the, how you think about that with DSPs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about AI for songwriters, right? What are maybe some of like the dangers of AI when it comes to songwriters? But also maybe let's also talk about the, the opportunity. What do, you, what do you think about this as someone who's helping artists from a label side? Yeah, sure. So and we already mentioned like ChatGPT for like lyrics and like talking about image generation. But um, I mean, everybody knows what happened with, you know, Drake and AI song, right? Hold on. How many of y'all heard that AI Drake song? We know. It's how many of you are willing to admit that it's a banger? It's fire, right? All right, cool, <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, it, I mean, I guess to answer that on like, I guess more of a personal level, it's like I can see why Obviously, Drake would have an issue of somebody kind of picking back on his creative success, right? And I get the other flip side of, you know, power to the people, like, I made this, right? So, I don't know, I mean, like, even as, as, as advice to artists, I think, like, if you're, you are using, like, AI, um, f um, finesse your prompts as well. So, I would recommend if you're going into the studio, and instead of just saying, you know, make 50 beats, he's like, you can go and say make 50, 50 beats in the start of Drake, right? It's not using Drake's music, right? But it's still the same creative process involved. So something like that is, I guess, a kind of a workaround as well. And like there's companies, like one's called um, Playbeat, and they will randomize your audio, like pitch, tempo, change the beat. And that's kind of like, you know it, you know. And it's like, it's a really cool way to think if you're like, if you're stuck in a bit of a rut in the studio, and you're like, you know, how do I change this up? Or, you know, you grab a song that you wrote five years ago that on GarageBand and you're like, you know, what can we do to this? So like Playbeat is an example is great. Uh, another one, quick shout out to Solaris and they do an amazing translation tool. So if you see your music's popping off in like Philippines, right? You can just say, let's translate this to Tagalog or, you know, whatever's going on. So it's another cool way of saying, hey, look, there's another market here, for example. Say if that's, that's what the data is showing you. You can use AI to, as a productivity tool, sorry, um, to rather than hiring another singer to sound like you and yeah. sing it in Portuguese. It's like, yeah. that's another way you can kind of finesse that. So now we've uncovered AI as a productivity tool, but you also brought in AI as a tool for inspiration. 100%, 100%. And yeah. have you guys dove into that yet? Are you using AI for inspiration? 
Dope. And also one of the things that you said, I just want to make sure we all um, picked up what you mentioned. You mentioned the importance of like being intentional with the prompts. Oh yeah. Right? Did you guys know what he meant when, when he said Sorry, being intentional yeah. with the prompts? Okay. I see a couple heads not shaking. Um, so just to know, most of these AI tools, right, they're not, you're not just hitting the random button and then it pops out something magical. It's all led by your prompts, right? Meaning you type a few sentences to give it direction of what you want and then it spits back the offering. And you'd be amazed at how different of a solution or of a outcome you get by just tailoring your prompts to be a little bit more intentional. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really not black and white at all. And you can change one word in your prompt. So obviously you rely on it to be a productivity tool to make it easier for you, but you only get out of it what you put in. So if you can actually spend time researching good prompts, like I've done that myself. Like there's a f couple of people I follow on Instagram and they're like, hey, here's 10 new prompts for this week. So I always think, oh, how can I use that from like a music marketing label point of view and tell my artists, like give that a go. Because it's all... It, like I said, it still comes back to you. Like, although it helps you as an output, you, the more you can do to work on your input into that, yeah. the better the output. You gotta know what to ask. Exactly, and that's Absolutely. part of the problem, but it's also on us to improve that and try new things. Absolutely. Um, give me like from a marketing perspective, I'm putting you on the spot here. Let's go. From a marketing perspective, give me like five ideas of prompts that you think artists can, can use mm. to get some tangible, like, Progress, and I'll give you one to start you off and how I'm thinking about this, Let's right? One of the ones that I like to use is um, when you're thinking about hashtags to use, super simple, going on there and say, hey, I'm an artist that makes this kind of music, here's my stuff, here are the, maybe uh, some of the ar other artists that my fans like, give me five to 10 to 15 uh, hashtags that I should be using in my Instagram captions to find new fans, right? Give us a few of those, like little little tips and tricks. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I mean, a really good one is, um, say you, there's someone who's music or marketing, the way that they are on TikTok or Instagram, you really like it, and you think, actually, I could learn a lot from this. You could type in, how does so-and-so market, them? Like, like break down 30 of the most recent posts. So it can do that and it'll be like, and it'll come like with a bit of like a couple of paragraphs about what their strategy is, what the engagement rate's been, why it's been like that. So I, I often use it to compare other people. So you can also say, compare the results or the last 30 posts between these two people as well. So that's another good thing to do is like, rather than trying to think about how you can originally come up with your own success, it's actually just saying, how does, how does everyone else do it? And then break it down. That's a good one. And like, I've even gotten as granular as said like, hey, if I'm an artist at you know, this level with this genre of music, what are the, the 10 best steps I should take oh, yeah. in order to build an audience of 100,000 fans online? And they'll literally break it down, right? And almost create a marketing plan for you, right? It's on you to still execute it and do the work, but a lot of the strategy, right, can can be gleaned from this tool. You got one more for me, or Ryan, or anybody? Y'all can y'all can collaborate here. Give us a prompt, Ryan. Give me a prompt, Ryan. A uh, typical prompt I would I would use for I guess marketing and tasks would be um, literally uh, give me twenty tasks that um, a, a major level a major label marketing um, team would would execute for for an artist. Oh, that's good. Um, something very simple, and then I, I tend to, with my prompts, slowly add on things to cater it to, I guess, to some degree, my expected result. But the, the good part is, a lot of times when, you do, when you're prompting, you get surprising results. And those are usually the ones that inform and inspire you the most. Going back to prompting as inspiration, that can happen on the productivity side as well, to where like, oh, I didn't think of that task, or this combination of tasks as being something meaningful. But I can see that in a lot clearer when I'm asking um, either ChatGPT or some of the other uh, large language models, as what they're called, um, for sort of catered information. Um, so that's what I would typically try and do on the marketing side. Right. I appreciate you guys sharing that. Um, so in a second, I, I do want to open it up for questions. So if you're someone who you're like, yo, I got these questions on deck, it's almost your time to shine. So um, before we get there, though, I want to I wanna also get your opinion on this. So a lot of artists have come out, especially songwriters, and they've been like, no, AI, you, you, you blocking my, my bread, right? There's even you know, a whole uh, writer's strike, right, in Hollywood, because mm -hmm. a lot of these artists were against it. Um, 
But on the flip side, I have seen an artist named Grimes, mm -hmm. shout out Grimes, who has actually embraced AI, right? And she's like, all right, well, if people are, are using this to jack my voice, go ahead and do it. And if I like it, I'll collab and give you the ability to do it, but I'm gonna take 50% of the royalties. Right? Smart. I think that's brilliant, mm -hmm. right? I wanna know, what, what are your thoughts and opinions on artists embracing AI, like major artists, right? Grimes is a world touring artist, right? What are your thoughts on an artist like that actually embracing AI and almost putting the battery in the back of her fans and producers to actually leverage her voice to make records? Yeah, I think it's absolutely amazing. I mean, even on like a very personal level day to day, the more that my artists and teams know about how to do it, yeah. the better. I'm best in my role when I know what gaps to fill and what people are good at and support that. If they're not good at it, that's where we jump in as well. So in that instance, I think it's great that the fact that she's said, this is what's happening. Like, this is now mine. You know, she's kind of take ownership of that. So I think the more that um, you can take ownership of that and say, this is my stamp on it. This is what we can do together. That kind of brings it back to that whole director fan kind of relationship as well. It's like, don't be scared by it and don't be scared of it because I'm a, you know, I'm a major artist. This is what we can do together. And I think you're including your audience in your own journey and progression, that's the key to everything. So like we, we I use a company called Tone Den. You know Tone Den? And so they, although it's not AI, but um, it's like a pre-save contest. So and you earn points to win whatever it is, like merch or a vinyl or something, um, through actions like following artists on socials. So it's twofold in the sense, it's a win-win for me and my artists because one, we're getting the data from these guys that like we said emails, you know, all those details, we can put them into the mailing list later on. Um, but we also involve them in our own journey. And it's like, hey, you want to you wanna get my signed stuff and be part of it? Sign up. Like, it's one button away. And then the third thing as well is that, you obviously, as part of the action to join the competition, they need to follow you on these various platforms. So you grow there as well. So that's a very, I mean, I, I wanted to shout about Tone Den anyway, but it's sure. like, it's just a great place to have that direct relationship with your fans. It's brilliant. That's what's up. And that's really the power. The power is in the direct relationship with your fans. Do you want to share your thoughts on Grimes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have uh, a very strong opinion about this, and it's that artists desperately need to embrace these tools. Mm. The way that Grimes is providing this specific service that she's providing, basically allowing people to use um, a language model of her voice and create whatever they want, I think that's probably a good indication of where things will be probably next year, you know, um, let alone three, four years from now. Um, and it's really about how you take that concept and you utilize it for your personal goals as an artist, as a business owner, as a, a, a photographer, a visual artist, right? You can use these ideas uh, for your own personal use and it's best to do it now before someone with a hundred million dollars goes and utilizes these tools right the the writer strike that's a real thing because the the people at the studios with large amounts of capital can in from their opinion maybe it's inaccurate can reduce their staff yeah. right so what do you do in that climate you you have to use the tools that everyone else is using before they become almost normalized to the degree of now you're on the outside looking in you know, um, so I think for me, I feel very strongly that all independent artists should be educating themselves heavily on how exactly did Grimes do this, right? right. Because from a, a sort of a legal standpoint, it's the way I think about it, the AI Drake voice, all of that, that can be really handled just like you handle sampling right now, right? If Drake released like a language pack, which is basically all the inflections of his voice and everybody can make a Drake track and it's 50-50 or probably less than 50-50, you know, to be honest. <laughs> you know, but you can sample his infinite versions of himself. I think that will likely happen sooner rather than later. Sometime this year, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen as a response to people doing it on their own independently, exploring. So get in before people with more resources come and blow the market out. That's what I would say. It's facts. And, and also it's like, Producers know this. Y'all are already on YouTube titling your beats Metro Boomin type beat, yeah. right? Drake type beat. So the opportunity to, to get in front of that and say literally featuring Grimes, an artist who has tens and millions of very rabid fans, I might add, yeah. it just gives you an opportunity to say, okay, I have this record and now let me go figure out where her fans live on the internet. 
and just make sure that they know about it, right? And now all of a sudden you're building a following in a meaningful way. So, cool. You know what, I'm, wait, hold on, I'm about to open it up. I'm about to open it up for questions. Let's get you a mic. Okay. So right now, because Nebby is guiding us here to questions from the audience, uh, before we get there, I need y'all to, to just make some noise of gratitude for these guys sharing the insight. And, um, oh, perfect, there you are. And Nadia is actually going to take a microphone around just so that way we can make sure everyone can hear you as you ask your questions. Um, the ask that I have as we ask these questions, I wanna try to get as many questions in as possible. So what I'm asking is let people know who you are and then just go right into your question. All right, let's do it. We'll start here in the front and then we're gonna go over to my man at the table over here. Okay, hey everybody, my name's Nebbia. Um, so. I'm, I'm a creative, I don't know, I do anything really. <laughs> like, you know, I try, I try, I'm, I got my hands in everything. But the fact that you mentioned that artist Grimes, basically like kind of licensing the style of her voice, I feel like as a, a writer, let's say you want to be a ghost writer. Let's say you don't want to be an artist yourself. Let's say you just want to write. Wouldn't that be like a good way maybe, okay, I'm writing a couple songs, I can pitch it to a label and maybe just get maybe like those credits or something like that. You guys understand the question I'm asking? Yeah, I think, let me paraphrase it. You're saying, if I'm a writer, is there an opportunity for me to write phenomenal songs and then use AI to put them in the sound and voice of popular artists? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. And then maybe pitch, your, pitch my services to people or artists, labels. Yeah, you guys think that's a decent strategy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, for demos, I think it's, it's phenomenal. You produce a track, here's how it would sound with, with Drake actually on it. Here's how it would sound with uh, you know, some major artist on it. That's a great way to make demos, to make it pop. And then they could have a, you know, 100%, I, I, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, completely agree. Like, I also, from like, my, with my marketing hat on, like, if you could go out and say, this is what I do, like, I am, I am the ghostwriter. <laughs> I am the AI ghostwriter, that's what I do, you know. I think that kind of, it's quite, um, it's intriguing because it is so new. And if you can get in early and say, that's what I do, you know, this is the sound I make. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe there's a way to tie it back to take it off AI. It's like, you know, this is actually a breakdown of what I did. Like, how do I actually get back to that? So that could be quite cool too. Dig it. My guy right here. Hi, I have two questions, so I'll try to be quick. But um, wait, start with your name. Let us know who you are, bro. I'm Luca. Okay. Sub Luca. Hey, Luca. How's everybody? Um, so my first question is um, like one of the most interesting things about the Grimes filter to me is I, I'm a singer, so like I don't really want to sound like Grimes. I want to sound like myself. Um, but it's like. Is there, do you think there's going to be like AI like plugins almost where like I can like add like breathiness to my voice or like AI like automatic melodyne for example. Like auto tune became like a stylistic choice and like do you think that there are going to be like AI stylistic you know, like blending type things? Absolutely. I mean a, a lot already kind of are in the works or kind of yeah, exist. Yeah I was going to say I think yeah. it's, already, it's already happening. And I think it's going to be a sort of revolution, a boom of those tools getting better and better, faster and faster within the next six months, I would say. Okay, cool. So I'll just look for this. <laughs> um, my other question is, um, earlier on, Matt, you said, um, you know, when things are like not working for you on like TikTok and like Instagram, it's like, you know, it's like recognize like what, like, like step back and do something differently. But how do you recognize what isn't working for you? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think if you can set yourself a goal of what you're trying to achieve quite earlier on, even if it's just numbers sometimes, I mean, but um, let's say you want to grow, what, like, do you mean like growing a following, for, for example, maybe, or? Yeah, so like, I, I like post a lot on Instagram and, and TikTok, and what I found is like a lot of my posts are really good at like nurturing the people who are already following me. Like a lot of people who I haven't seen in a while, who I will see, will be like, I see your posts, like I love what you're doing, like keep it going. But it like doesn't bring in that many like new followers in my experience. Yeah, I mean, well to be honest, I mean, it, there's also a reason why I guess you're building the following in the first place, and the reason that it's actually, I'd say it's harder to maintain uh, an audience that keep coming back to you, I think. I think if you're constantly trying new people and new things, it can get quite muddy in a way, um, but 
I also get that there's two sides to it, obviously. And the other side, I'd say, is look at other people who are at a similar stage to you or somewhere where you want to be. Break it down and be like, you know, how often are they posting? How often do they change their content? Are they posting three times a day? Or like, I mean, TikTok, you know, they say, what, you post three to five times a week or three to five times a day. Like, it really doesn't matter. For me, at least in my experience, in terms of posting frequency, it's 100% quality over quantity. There's people out there who post once a month and get about 16 million views on it. So obviously that's one end of the scale. So to answer your question, um, I wouldn't get too worried as well about the fact that um, growing a new audience is um, too much of a focus. I think the fact that you are retaining the people that like the content you're putting out, that's not something you should forego. But also, do take a step back and see what other people are doing who are in a similar level to you. And be like, why are they doing that? Um, I think that's a really good way to do it. Yeah, you mind if I add to that? Just go for it, yeah. I think also, like, if you know, Luca, that you're trying to grow your audience, um, there's this really complicated strategy called who gives a shit, <laughs> right? Like really stepping back and asking yourself when you post, right? Like, of course you made the thing, so you care about it, but really asking yourself objectively, like who is gonna give a shit that this post is on the internet? And better, better framed, it's who is this, who's gonna find this valuable, right? And what I've noticed is like for my own personal um, content on like Instagram, the posts that go the furthest are the posts that are about me sharing value for someone else, right? So if you look back and you realize like, oh, this was me doodling, but it's really not that entertaining, right? It's not that soothing, right? Some people like watching the soothing stuff or it's not joy or it's not shocking, right? Or whatever the thing is or informative or just genuinely helpful, people aren't gonna wanna share it. Because I believe as humans, if we care, we share, right? So if people aren't sharing your stuff, then that's, a, that's some feedback, right? So I think for me, I would also, you know, if I were you, I would think about who is your target fan that you really want to be a fan. Ask them why they fuck with your stuff, right? And they'll probably give you some really good insight into what the value is that they take from it. So it might help inform how you should show up. Okay, cool. Just to add Thank to that you. as well, the Instagram poll feature is elite, okay? Facts. Facts. Like, people think like there's some new AI hacks that we're all talking about here, but Instagram poll function is your market research. Yeah. Use it. Be like, when, what do you want to hear more of? What, what, what do, you, do you not want to hear more of? Like, I tell everyone that every day, Instagram polls. That's good. Cool. Thank you. You got it, man. Thanks for your questions. Hi, y'all. Uh, really appreciate all the stuff you're talking about. This has been really very interesting and informative. Uh, my name is Owen. <laughs> Hi, Owen. So I go Owen. by I go by OE when I'm making music. Um, I'm I I feel like not not to play devil's advocate, but I I've been hearing a lot of sort of uh, on the positive side of a lot of technology stuff. But I think speaking of like learning from history, we also know how like when new technologies come out, there are also a bunch of uh, downsides and problems that emerge from those technologies that we can't necessarily predict. Um, and, you, you know, streaming, for example, right, in theory is a great way to get uh, exposure to a whole bunch of more people, uh, but the ways larger corporations uh, leverage that and, and use that to make it so that artists aren't earning as much money off of the streams we're actually getting, um, right? That, that's something that we couldn't have necessarily known coming. So I'm really curious from all your perspectives um, with regards to AI, and, and, and not even just specifically AI, but also just technology that's coming down the pike in general, what do you feel like are the, the things, like the downsides that are coming that people aren't talking about? Because, because obviously people are talking about sort of the copyright issues and people are talking about the, uh, you know, the sort of, I guess, creative soul issues of, oh, you're stealing my voice, oh, you're, but like, what are the things that you feel like are, are, are dangers to creatives and just in general that people aren't really talking about and that people don't know to look for as we're sort of moving forward with all this? Yeah, I would say that um, one of the key things, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, me personally, I think the existing concerns over copyright and the creative soul, I think that, that will be normalized by next year. We won't even say, oh, this is an AI tool, we'll just be using better stuff. 
everyone in the room will be using better stuff by this time next year. We won't think about it like that. So I think those fears are just the normal sort of sort of uh, surface level things. The, the really interesting problematic thing now is the problem with privacy and identity with regards to how the normal methods of verifying those things aren't really keeping up with the evolution of these tools. You know, I can make a deep fake of somebody committing a crime or me pretending to, to scam someone and or, you can create very complex scams and fraud, fraudulent situations. And I think that is already happening at a large scale and there's no way really to punish it, so to speak. So I think that to me is the biggest threat that anyone can impersonate you or take your identity and the tools for them to do that are low barrier to entry. It doesn't take a genius hacker to you know, take ruin your whole life basically. And so not to be so dark about it, but to me that's the most practical, realistic fear that everyone should have um, about these tools, how they can be used very specifically to impersonate you or um, otherwise uh, take something from you. And I, I want to I say this, Owen, oh, I'm really grateful that you um, called out the bias in our conversation for leaning positively into technology, right? But I want to be very clear as to why we're doing that. We're doing that because, and I'll say for myself, I don't want to speak for you guys, I deeply believe that there has never been a better time for independent artists to create art. So when you mention like, oh man, we didn't realize streaming was actually gonna not pay us that much money. So before streaming, everything was run by the labels and for 99% of artists who were signed to labels, it was shitty, right? But now we have this tool that allows us to get our music in front of all these people and that we can go direct to consumer. There's no middleman telling us what we're worth, right? There's no middleman saying we deserve access to an audience or we don't, right? It's just us and the fans who say, yo, this is lit. So it's almost like there's this opportunity now. You could be the most obscure artist on the planet. You might be like, I'm a one in a million kind of person. But because technology is here, we know that there's at least 8,000 people just like us. And that's by the numbers, right? There's 8 billion people on the planet. And because of technology, we can actually get our art to them. So that's why we're so positive around this conversation and optimistic because it's like, Literally, we're in the beginning of a gold rush. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, yeah, we can complain about, hey, we only get paid out 0.000356%, right, per stream. Accurate. But even in the streaming era, there's an artist like Nipsey Hussle who literally sold an album for $100 and for $1,000 and fans bought it, right? So that's why we're so positive about this because it's like we can get in our heads about the destructive sides of what's happening but if we spend too much time there, we'll miss this whole gold mine that people are literally changing their lives on every single day. So that's why I, I think you know, we, we're gonna take that angle, but I appreciate you calling out the bias because we've definitely been biased. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I just wanna honor that too. So thank you for keeping us honest. Cool. Where are we at next? Uh, you had a question here uh, and then we'll go, we'll go here and we'll start to get the folks in the back. We see you there. So I, I had two questions, if that's okay, right? Let's so the, the first, my name is Terrence Harris, Thanks. and my first question is, when it comes to the data points that you said back up, just a theory that you might have for marketing or distributing a track or something, what do you all compare that to in terms of the, the real life influence people have, you know, specifically as it relates to customer acquisition costs and then like the lifetime value that you get from that? Because it's like, I have a lot of influence on people in real life, and then I also have a lot of influence online. So what, as it from a distributing standpoint, and either of y'all who wanna fill in, like, what is the most important priority when you're utilizing these technologies and you know, creating that influence for someone to tap in with something? I love this kind of question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I say, I mean, a lot of my role is very creative, right? Uh, but we always back it up with data, so that's like the bottom line. Okay? Bottom line. Yeah, um, so in terms of stuff that I look for, I mean, I'd say like location demographics, huge, new markets. Um, checking out what's happening on UGC on your TikTok sounds is like a gold mine. So it's like, what communities am I actually reaching out to? If I've got a huge cosplay community using my sound, maybe I should go 
engage with that, speak to them a bit more. So this, um, so that age demographics, you know, all the all the standard ones as well, like you know, that you get from Spotify for artists and on chart metric and spot on track. But um, something like um, TikTok UGC is a great place to see what people are actually doing with your music. It's like they're more than just listening to it; they're actually made the effort to make a video out of it. So. When you talk about real world influence, that, I think that's a very good place to see where they've gone a step beyond just liking the song or even, you know, just playing it once for the 10 duration seconds. duration and all of those things. Exactly. Right? It's like that actually, I know I've been talking a lot about TikTok, but I'm just saying it's a very good way of gauging what goes beyond just a stream. You see people actually using it to, to create something that they want on their own channel. That's like a huge um, compliment, right? So that's... Does that, is that a good example? That was an so excellent question. question. It's very simple and concise, and so I'll just it goes right into my second question. In terms of, I've built communities, and what I've found, and this is my personal opinion, and y'all can chime in as well. The ethics and the commitment from people has diminished over time, and that's why I like AI because it's not biased. It has no personal feelings towards mm -hmm. what you ask of it. So, like, oftentimes you can give people a great position in real life, and for example, like a job. I'm looking for a job currently. And I find that when, you, when I go to job environments, no one shares the vision or the passion of like what the organization or the job that they work for is. So my question is, how can I find an ethical space to get into the creative industry that's like consistent? Because I want to be a part of a job in like a bigger, larger you know, ecosystem and industry. But oftentimes, I'm finding that the people a part of it don't value those positions and that access that they have they generally just be like, oh, this is just a check, or this is, I'm just here to, you know, just because it's consistent, you know, but it's not because they believe in the vision hmm. of the company that they work in. I look at Apple, like, people there seem overall to care about yeah. what they're getting accomplished there, like, what's the result, what they're providing for the community, who they serve, what you just said with the music, which is what being a creative is all about, like, noticing, like, there are people like you who might think like you, so how do we create those communities or those ecosystems specifically in a work environment? Like, I want to learn how to do that in a work environment. That's, a, that's an interesting take. Um, and I'm super biased just because, like, I would like to believe that the people that work here in this space okay. believe in the vision of why we're here or else I don't really think they'd be here for very long. Right, we just had, we talked about Scarlett. I don't think Scarlett would be here if she was just here for the check, because in the beginning of them eight years, the check was not pretty. Facts. And at the very beginning of them, the check was non-existent, right? So I'm a little biased just because I happen to be in a work environment where people are bought in. Um, I would like to believe those places exist. Okay. However, like, I think Apple is a crazy example just because like they started really small and now they're huge. Um, and they were able to maintain that level of buy-in, right, before they were paying people hundreds of thousands of dollars to work there. But to me, that's what startup culture is all about. I don't believe people go to work at startups because they're just there for the check. Because most of the times, again, the checks aren't nice, right. you know? Um, but if you go to like, no offense, like a government job or like you go to some big corporation where you're one of 12,000 employees, like, some, it's okay, you there for the bread. Yeah. And that's and fine. Is that why AI can probably replace them e easier? Those types of mentalities versus, like you said, being sold in on the culture. I got you. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's businesses that are that are that are fueled by passionate, committed people, and there's other businesses that are just fueled by bodies and seats. And I think you just got to make sure that the place that you're going to is the former, and not the latter. You know, but they exist. I don't want you to get oh, dishopeful because they exist. They definitely exist. There's also a great AI tool that helps you write resumes, by the way. That just, part. Just, uh, I, I've got it written down. Come find me after. I'll send it to you. My friend um, used it and he got a job from it. And Inspire. It's, I know, right? And it's creative. He, like, he literally just said, this is what I've done. This is what I want to be doing. Tell me my skills. And it's like, right, this, this is clearly what you're good at. Yeah. So anyway. Find your people. All right, so let's make sure we get uh, this guy over here. Your hand's been up for a while. I want to get your question. And then this young lady over here uh, in the back at the brown, we'll go to her next. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name's Trey. And um, I kind of have a two-part question. I was wondering, like, I was hearing you guys talk about, um, like, referencing Drake and being like, you know, you can prompt AI to make 50 beats in the style of Drake. So I was wondering if you think that people... Like there could be like an oversaturation of people trying to copy and I don't know make 
or create content and music like whoever is the most successful at the time and if that might change the standard for music creation. But hasn't that always if been that the makes thing? sense. Yeah, yeah and actually, I've got a good answer to that, I think. So if you think back like what, with what happened with like NFTs, for example, okay? Everybody was just been terrified about people making bank on these different kinds of coins. But I think in terms of all different art, art forms, because what we do is music, right? It's all very subjective. So even if it is oversaturated, there's always going to be a point of we, what we assign the value to be. So if you do have an audience or a market for it, or there's too many, there's always going to come down to what people resonate with. So even if there are 50 beats that like, you're like, these are all fire, these are great, you're still going to want to pick one or two, right? And that's like the value that you've assigned to that. Um, so I think even if it does become an incredibly saturated, you know, same thing with NFTs, NFTs are anywhere, the value is still perceived by us. And what we do is so artistic and based on emotion, right? So I still think there'll always be that, I don't know, human element that will cut through, regardless of how much, you know, rubbish there is out there. Okay. Uh, that's, and, that's my answer anyway. And then I had a second question, which I think this sort of ties in. I was wondering, which I guess that's sort of what this talk was also going into, but if you guys see like a niche or like an emerging niche, maybe even in marketing or maybe in music that isn't really noticed by people due to the rise of like technology and AI. So like for example, like no one really thought like being a social media marketer was gonna be a job. I'm wondering if you guys are already seeing like these roles that could exist that people just don't know about because the technology has just gotten here. Absolutely. Prompt engineer. Straight up. Yes, Prompt Straight engineer. Up. And it sounds kind of silly, but really, it's a person with great ideas and ability to communicate them. Being able to do that really well will be more important in moving forward than it ever has been. Because now, there's going to be so many people that they were geniuses, but they didn't have the resources, the time, the energy to put in the 10,000 hours to become an expert necessarily but they had the idea and they could convey it with their thoughts and words very well. Prompt engineers, that's a real position that I've seen, uh, you mentioned government jobs, there's government jobs looking for quote unquote prompt engineers, Apple prompt engineers, right? These are positions that exist that I'm not even sure they understand fully what they are, yep. but those type of things will continue to grow as these tools become more, um, I guess, ubiquitous. Straight up. Fun fact, go to uh, a, a site like Upwork or any of those marketplaces, right? There's a bunch of them. Fiverr, look at all the writing gigs that are on there. People are paying people to write resumes, people are paying people to write copy, right, for advertising. You can literally go on there, take those gigs, go write to ChatGPT, write a little bit about that company, create the right prompt, gold mine. Right? And you're really just arbitraging like, oh, these are people who don't understand AI, they're not using ChatGPT themselves, or they just don't think they're good at writing the prompts. Most people are not using ChatGPT yet, right? We think everyone is, but I think they said something like 12% of adults have actually used it. There's a lot of money waiting to be had by someone who's like, okay, thank you. Well, thank you, good answers. For sure. Cool, so I wanna make sure we get this young lady uh, in the back, and then we'll come back to your question here. Yeah, I appreciate y'all questions, by the way. These are great. Yeah, these are great. Well, hello. Hi, my name is Nikki. Um, and hi, friend over there. He, I was actually my question that he, that he asked. So okay. I have a new question that I had to think about. Um, so, mm, English is hard. Wait. <laughs> That's why ChatGPT exists. Yeah, Psych 100%. Now. Psych oh, now. yeah. Well, one, thank you for that information about the whole writing gigs. And it's like, hi, here, thank you. Like, bio, it. like bio writers yeah. is over. Okay, yeah, I'm going to use that. Thank you very much. Um, what do you think is something that people readily misunderstand about, like this is for you guys uh, personally, what do you think they readily misunderstand about what you do? And how do you think that affects you in general, if it does at all? And how would you dispel that? Sorry, what do you mean by, so when you say what we do, do you mean like our... Yeah. So, so for example, as like in a and r or as a talent manager what do people not understand about your job and and is there any um negative consequences of that because people just don't understand your job was that your question yeah okay. pretty much yeah thank you 
I would say in general, a lot of people don't even understand what an A&R is. Facts. Does yeah. everyone know what it stands for? Please yeah. share. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> y'all artists and producers, y'all don't even know what A&R stands for? Educate us, please. <sighs> of, that, you know we about to do that. <laughs> Go ahead, y'all. So our artists and repertoire. Um, so in the current landscape, in the current environment, in A&R, they might be the person that connects the dots on a lot of different projects. They might be the person that signs, helps you get the deal um, that you're looking for when you're part of a label. That A&R is going out and connecting you with the best manager, you know, ideally. That A&R is going and acting on behalf of the label to a degree, but also on the behalf of the artist to an extent. Right? That's, that's the perfect marriage of it. But in, by and large, an A&R is is really that connective tissue on a high level mm -hmm. to the artist, the project, the result. Okay. I'd say for my role, it's... Wait, wait, oh, real, sorry, real sorry. quick, just because yeah. the second part of our question was, do you think that because people don't really know what A&Rs do, and I'd say in general, right, most right, people right. don't know what A&Rs do, has that ever been, uh, has that ever made your job harder? I'll put it that way. Uh, sometimes it makes it harder, sometimes it makes it easier, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> Um, Fair enough. Because the expectation's kind of all over the place. And so when you deliver, it's always great. Fair. So and you're like, I was just doing my job. Yeah, yeah. So nice. How about for you? Uh, I guess, I mean, just because marketing's pretty broad, it can be everything and mm. kind of nothing as well. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so um, it's like I can be, you know, working to up a mural in Nashville. Yeah. Then I can also be helping Zon start a Discord community, and then I'm also working with, you know, a TikToker to, you know, do a um, a tastemaker campaign to plug a song. So because it is incredibly diverse, what well, in in ways that we can service our artists, um, it it it, it means it could be anything, and that's the problem. So yeah. I guess in terms of, but and I actually agree with Ryan in the sense that the more people ask about it, I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't really think about that. That's actually a really good idea. And through people's lack of understanding or ignorance or whatever, it actually generally makes me think a bit more about what I could do to make them not want to ask that question. I don't, I don't know. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Yeah. And may I ask a little second part of that? And the t uh, piggybacking off it, their question was for the uh, oversaturation aspect. Mm. In an industry of creatives, there's so many different types of YouTubers, so many different types of artists, like illustration artists, digital artists, singers, producers, everything. How, what are your top three tips of how to make yourself stand out and be unique instead of just being a copy and paste cookie cutter following just the fad to become famous? How can you maintain your voice in a field where people are like, you're never gonna make it because there's so many of us out here. I'm really, really passionate about this one. Can I take this one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so the oversaturation concept for me is one that we should just throw away. And here's why. The last time you went to the grocery store, if you go to the water aisle, <laughs> there's like 30 different waters you can choose from, right? People are buying them, right? Most of it's just water, right? But I think what happens is in the creative space, we want to believe that like there's this scarcity mindset. If someone watches that person, then they're not going to watch me. But that's not how it works, right? And I think when we put on that abundance mindset, we realize that there's an audience out here for all of us. So to answer your question more directly, what are like maybe the, the three things you can do to cut through? I think the first one, and this is a word that's so overused, but I'm gonna use it anyway, is authenticity. The people who have the courage to actually be themselves have such a leg up for two reasons. The first reason is because people can smell when you're being fake. And they might not be able to articulate it, but they'll just be like, mm, I'll, I'll mess with it. But people know, right? And then the second reason why authenticity is really important is because it leads to what I think the second thing that'll set you apart is when you're authentic, it's so much easier to be consistent. When you're authentic, it just being you and you can just turn the camera on and just do your thing, it doesn't require as much energy, right? So those people who are faking the funk, it takes so much energy because they have to perform right, as opposed to just be. And that idea of being consistent, right, over time, like, yo, I've been watching this person, they've been posting every week for five years, they know you are serious. They know you're committed and they trust you. And really, again, all we're trying to do when we build audiences is build trust. So I think the second thing is that. 
And then I think the third thing that I would suggest someone do to really cut through is get to know your audience as much as humanly possible. Know what makes them tick, right? So that way you're really having those, you're creating those inside jokes, right? You're, you're creating those moments that only y'all can have. And then understand where else are they spending their time on the internet and collaborate with those people. Because that gives you an opportunity to, to steal the other people's fans, right? For real, for real. So be authentic. And with that, be consistent. And then align yourselves with the other people that your audience likes, because that's a way to, to be able to, to steal those fans. But there is no such thing as oversaturation. Like, how many, how many you know, songs are being uploaded to DSPs every day? A whole a, lot. A whole lot, right? <laughs> but there's a whole lot of people out here listening to music and looking for new music, but they really only want to stick around to the people that they identify with and that they feel are authentic. So, is that helpful? Yeah, you're welcome. Cool. So let's go to you. Your hand. Your hand's been up. Um, and then I think after that, is that our last question? Or do we have time for one more? We can do one more after you. Cool. So let's go. Uh, how about let's try to do fast. Let's do a Rob, and then I want your question because you had notes being taken and the laptop vibe. So I want you to bring us home with the perfect question. No pressure. So let's see if we can speed through these last three. Go for it. All right. So my name is Elijah. I just want to thank you all for your time. Um, my question is regarding post Hamas albums. How are you, how is AI going to interact in that game? I know a lot of people are like, they're upset about people dropping stuff after they die, that's in a vault. And then there's this AI aspect that could be like unpacking like samples from like the 50s, the 40s, like the time periods that, you know, all we do is sample this stuff and we got, you know, Al Green sample on 15,000 different songs, but it's all old. How can we use that to like, kind of like leverage to maybe bring some new old content versus like the like legalities and like the iffiness of that? I'm really excited about the future of that. I think that will be a whole sampling genre, yeah. right? Infinite Al Green, you know, listen to, new, listen to a new Al Green track every day for the rest of your life, you know? That's gonna be the future. Al Green feature of future. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, why not? Nasty work. Featuring yeah, SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> hey. Because of Chat GPT. That's yeah. crazy. In the style of Prince. Yeah. You know, I think um, I'm excited about that. I think um, it's, it's inevitable almost. The, you know, the Pandora's box is open. It's, you know, and so I think that's going to become a, a, a really large almost subgenre. But to me, it's not so drastically different from existing sampling capability, to be honest. It will be just better for the fans. It's funny. I've never thought about the whole after artists die part of that conversation. I think that's mad scary, uh, personally. Yeah. But my hot take of just like where AI music goes specifically, just to say it in like 30 seconds, is I think we're going to get to a point where when you go on a DSP, records are going to have a like verified check symbol, right? When I'm looking at the artist profile, and that specifically is going to indicate that that song actually came from the artist that you're looking at. All the rest are going to be AI flips of that artist style. Right? That's kind of how I see the future of that going. Um, and I think fans are going to love both. But every now and then you're going to be like, I only want to hear the stuff that he actually wrote, so like, let me listen to that. So it's going to be kind of like a cover tag. Right, like a cover tag. Exactly. Thanks for that question. Cool. So we'll go back to A-Rob, and then we're going to land it with my man right here. I didn't even realize your shirt. Wow. You're a legend. That's crazy. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm A-Rob, rapper, audio engineer. Uh, I just wanted to bring it back to Amuse and Rec. This question is for all you guys. How are you guys going to use this technology to help artists, or how are you going to help artists use this technology to further their careers, help them market, maybe get sync opportunities, whatever it might be? How are you going to help artists use all this new technology? Um, at least from my part. So, like I said, a lot of my role is very creative, and I'm I, even before this whole AI conversation. Even bef I mean, I cut my teeth doing a lot of TikTok stuff, for example. So even before that, and I didn't really know what it was. So, um, what I it was part of my role. I need to make sure that I know what I'm talking about, and but it's all with the intention of championing the artist. So, not every AI filter idea will work for everyone that I work with. Um, but I guess being able to identify what makes sense for the artists on their point from a creative standpoint and with their music, if I'm confidently saying something to them, I want them to know that I believe in it. So I guess it's one is 
using it to help uh, help develop my relationship with my artists, knowing that they know that I'm out there fighting for them, looking for new ways to get their, get streams, you know, get, find an agent, whatever. So, um, I'm going off on a tangent now. What was the question was how my <laughs> how are you guys leveraging? Yeah, the tools? how yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, just being an expert and trying new things and like under, like doing stuff like this, like hearing from you guys. It's like a huge thing for me because then I can go take them. Like, hey guys, I've heard from the artists themselves over in Philly. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like, so yeah, it helps develop my relationship with them, but also gives them the confidence to try new things as well. Because at the end of the day, I can only suggest things to my artists. I need them to commit. So it's all about developing that relationship, being a two-way street. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. You want to add to that from the Amuse side? Uh, yeah, on the Amuse side, two things: insights. Amuse has very detailed data, data gathering tools that leverage machine learning, and we've been doing that since the beginning, and that's been a key reason why we're able to do things that other distributors can't do and provide artists and our own marketing teams with detailed information about why did this blow up, right? Is this the artist that's next up? Why are they the artist that ne that's next up? It's a little bit more than just, oh, all the graph is going up. You know, there's a lot of different data points, and so we've been using AI and leveraging it for years um, to really do that. And more recently, we're providing um, AI mastering uh, in the future. And so I think that's something that is very, very beneficial and hyper-specific to this conversation. Um, but that's something that um, we can specifically uh, do. Uh, and then from the, the rec side, um, yeah, we're, we're thinking a ton about AI. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've learned really quickly um, is the artists who get the most value out of Rec early on are the ones who tend to build a relationship with Scarlett, <laughs> right? Because Scarlett's like the key to the kingdom when it comes to like, once Scarlett gets to know you, what your goals are, right? She can proactively be like, oh, you're doing this thing. You're coming to the creator talk, right? Or, oh, I heard you were working on your album. Do you know this producer? Or, yo, did you see this gig that just came up for you? Because I know you're a photographer. Um, so we've been playing around with this idea of like, what would it look like for every artist to have access to a Scarlet in your pocket, right? Yeah. To, to use AI to curate specifically and personalize to you what gigs in the ecosystem you should know about, what collaborations and relationships you should be building, and of course, um, you know, what events and information might help you at that specific part of your journey. Uh, so that's a tool we're working on right now. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, you're going to bring us home. You ready? You sure? All right, you look confident. Uh, oh, I thought you were confident until you did that. <laughs> no, you're good. My name is Ben. Um, I'm an artist, a uh, visual, visual artist. Um, uh, I hear a lot of creators in the space here are musicians creating audio. And then we're talking about promotion and through AI. I have about five-ish years of AI experience creating visuals. Oh, before yeah. the wave. What's that? Before the wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were trying to get people on the wave. Love yeah. that for you. <laughs> um, that being said, visually, how do you see this helping promote musicians? This is a little self-serving, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to throw that one up. How do you expect, like, there's always a music video. There's always um, marketing materials. There's um, decks to convince people to book you. There's all of this, like, we're free range answer for that, that angle. Yeah, um, I mean, one idea that I really like is actually generating artwork. And so, but then taking it a step further, what I also like to try and do, I actually haven't done this yet, but I'm going to do it, um, is work with an artist, create an um, artwork cover, and then kind of like um, waterfall the release. So if we're releasing a couple of singles from an EP, actually use uh, the tool from the Adobe Photoshop to extend it and then take little segments of that and then use that as the single artworks and then the EP. So something like that could be kind of cool. Or, but you mentioned decks, yeah, I write, I do a lot of decks. Like, <laughs> I would really like some help with that, would be great. Uh, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I think also what um, Ryan was talking about from the video element, that when, that, when that happens, is it happening? When it happens? It's happening. It's, it's happening. happening. That is gonna be incredibly cool. Like, obviously we've all seen people's faces move like we saw the like the harry potter balenciaga stuff have we seen that it's pretty funny yeah yeah um i mean if that's just the start like even from yeah you mentioned music videos that'd be great and i work with a lot of creative assets so if i can literally visually move a piece of artwork or uh, even like a, a press shot 
I'd might, be great if I could pitch like a small moving press shot when I'm talking to Spotify. I can be like, this is actually what they're doing. I'm like, you can see them moving. So I mean, that's quite a specific granular take on it, but does that help? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Cool. Do you want to add to that or? Yeah. I, I, I definitely, again, I, I think it's of course the future. I think um, in terms of artists utilizing it for rollouts, it just adds another layer of dynamic complexity to your release. Instead of, oh, I have to drop the track, but I need to wait to spend 2500 on a videographer so we can shoot the thing, et cetera, et cetera. You can do something where you uh, use text-to-video tools. Those tools do exist right now. Uh, there's one called Kyber um, that you should check out. There's obvious, not obviously, but there's one called Runway. Um, anyone that has an iPhone can download it right now for free and try it out and type in a prompt of basically anything, and it will generate a, I think, three to four second video. Right? Um, so if you can generate a three to four second video of anything, maybe you could sit down there for about two hours and generate a whole album's worth of visuals for your project. That's your social right? content for like a rollout. That's brilliant. You know? Yeah. And so that's, that's, you can do that right now. You could probably do it before you leave here. You know? So I, that's where I see things going with video. And to me, um, all of the platforms that we see emerging now, like we talk about TikTok, all these things, the commonality is that they're high fidelity. They all have video involved. It's all visuals. What's the next layer of that? There will be another layer. I'm not, I don't know if it's going to be VR, et cetera. We haven't touched on that at all. It's a, it's a dirty word almost. We'll see what happens with the Apple thing. You know, but um, what's the next level? Because it will keep being more and more dynamic. I'm an independent artist. Now I'm going to have a whole movie for my projects, right? I'm an independent artist, maybe I can make a, a little video game for my project utilizing some new AI tools, right? I think people should start thinking outside the box of their current limitations and start saying, what are the major labels doing? What are these huge companies doing? Because now I can probably do it at home to a lesser degree at first, but the, the waters are kind of uh, hitting equilibrium to where you have the same tools Drake has, right? You, you have the same tools they have. So that's what I would say on, on that. And I guess to close it, I would say AI, artificial intelligence, is a tool made by humans for humans. So keep that in mind. That's a bar. Listen, I need y'all to make some noise for Ryan and Matt and the whole news team.